We've talked about a couple of first top redundancy protocols already in this module. Here's another one for you, GLBP, Gateway Load Balancing Protocol. And as the name suggests, one of the big benefits it brings to the table is the ability to do load balancing easier than we could do it otherwise. For example, think about HSRP. With HSRP, we had an active router, we had a standby router, and the active router was actively forwarding traffic, but the standby router was not. It was just sitting around waiting for the active router to fail. And if we did want to use that router and not just have it sit there dormant, what we could do is do some manual load balancing. We could have traffic for one VLAN or one subnet treat that standby router as the active router for that VLAN and have another VLAN use the other router as the active router for that VLAN. But that was administrative overhead. We had to manually configure load balancing. We get load balancing automatically with GLBP. With GLBP, we can have all of our routers forwarding traffic without the need to go in and say, this VLAN uses this router and this VLAN uses that router. And a couple of terms we need to know when we're talking about GLBP. We're going to have one router, that's the Active Virtual Gateway, or the AVG. The AVG is going to respond to ARP requests that are coming in from the host. And when a host says, hey, what's the MAC address for, let's say, 10.1.1.1, if that's our virtual IP address, the Active Virtual Gateway is going to respond and say, here's the MAC address for that virtual IP address. And the virtual MAC address that it hands out is the MAC address corresponding to an AVF, an Active Virtual Forwarder. And this Active Virtual Forwarder is going to do the job of actually forwarding traffic off of the local subnet. And we can have as many as four active virtual forwarders within a group. We can have some other virtual forwarders that are not currently active, they're standing by, but we can have as many as four active virtual forwarders that are simultaneously able to send traffic off of a subnet. And to demonstrate how it works, consider PC1 on screen. It's going to send an ARP request up to router R1 because router R1 in this example is acting as the AVG, the active virtual gateway. And that ARP request is going to say, what is the MAC address corresponding to 10.1.1.1? That's PC1's default gateway. And R1, acting as the active virtual gateway, is going to respond and say, the MAC address for 10.1.1.1 is 1111 .1111 Obviously, that's a MAC address I just made up to make this easier to visualize. But it's going to respond with the MAC address that corresponds to an active virtual forwarder, an AVF. And in this case, R1, in addition to being an AVG, it's also an AVF. It's saying, here's my MAC address as an AVF, send your frames to me. And PC1 now has a MAC address corresponding to its default gateway's IP address. Fantastic, it can now send traffic off of its local subnet. Now PC2 needs to know how to get off of this subnet. PC2, it's configured with a default gateway of 10.1.1.1, just like PC1 was. It also sends an ARP request, which is going to be handled by router R1, acting as the active virtual gateway. And it's asking the same question that PC1 did. It's asking, what is the MAC address corresponding to 10.1.1.1? But this time, the active virtual gateway says, the MAC address corresponding to 10.1.1.1 is this all twos MAC address. It gave a different answer to PC2 than it gave to PC1. And who has that virtual MAC address? It's a different AVF. It's R2. R2 has the all twos virtual MAC address assigned to it. And how did R2 get that virtual MAC address? Well, as an active virtual forwarder, router R2 discovered that virtual MAC address from the AVG based on hello messages. And now when PC2 attempts to send traffic off of the local subnet, it's going to the same default gateway IP address that PC1 is using. However, it's going to be using a different router because the MAC address in the layer 2 header of that Ethernet frame, it's destined for R2 instead of R1. This is how we get load balancing without doing any administrative work to say this VLAN goes here and that VLAN goes there. We get load balancing automatically. And by the way, we do get more than load balancing. We also get redundancy. If router R2 were to go down, that would be detected by router R1. And R1 would become active for the all twos virtual MAC address. And there are some timers that say how long the AVG will continue giving out that virtual MAC address in response to ARP queries, and how long router R1 in this case 
is going to continue servicing that MAC address. We'll talk about those timers in our next video when we get into the configuration. But realize we're getting load balancing and we're getting redundancy thanks to GLBP. But there is a big design caveat that I need you to know about, and it deals with STP, Spanning Tree Protocol. Can you see that if we were using multi-layer switches instead of these routers, if those multi-layer switches were connected in a Layer 2 Spanning Tree topology, where one of them was the root, in a case like that, since we're doing load balancing across as many as four multi-layer switches or four routers at the same time, with Spanning Tree Protocol, we might have some suboptimal pathing because Spanning Tree Protocol might be forcing us to go to, let's say, switch SW1 when a particular PC's active virtual forwarder was a different multi-layer switch. And as a result, if you are using multi-layer switches with GLBP and those switches are part of a Layer 2 Spanning Tree, you might consider using HSRP instead of GOBP because of this suboptimal pathing you could get. But if you're not, or if you are using routers like we're showing in this topology, this is a great way to do load balancing. In fact, we can go in and tweak how the load balancing works. Let's talk about the three different load balancing options that GOBP has. The default load balancing option is round robin. With round robin, our active virtual gateway is going to be responding to ARP queries by giving out the virtual MAC addresses of all of the active virtual forwarders an equal amount of times. With round robin, in this example, the AVG is going to respond to one ARP request by saying the MAC address for 10.1.1.1 is the all ones MAC address. And it will respond to the next ARP request by saying it's the all twos MAC address. Then it will go back to the all ones, then the all twos. Maybe we had four routers, maybe we had four multi layer switches. It would give out the MAC address for each of those AVFs an equal amount of times. With round robin, we're doing equal load balancing across all of our AVFs. And I say we're doing equal load balancing, realize that the traffic is not going to be perfectly load balanced because some clients will send more traffic than other clients, but at least we're equally dispersing the different AVF MAC addresses. Another load balancing option is host dependent. We're probably not going to use this option that much, but if you do have a design requirement that says a particular PC or a particular host needs to always point to a specific MAC address as its default gateways MAC address, you can configure that. You can link together a specific host to always get the same ARP reply, to always get a reply saying the MAC address for this default gateway is whatever you want the MAC address to be. And remember, round robin is the default, and with round robin, we're giving each of our AVFs an equal weighting. We're giving out their MAC addresses an equal amount of times. However, we might not want that. We might have a higher powered router, or we might have a higher powered multi-layer switch, and we want that switch or that router to get the bulk of the traffic. We want to give out its virtual MAC address more often than we give out the virtual MAC address of an older router that might be part of this GLBP group. And we can do that using the weighted load balancing option. With the weighted load balancing option, we can associate a weight with different active virtual forwarders. For example, let's say that we gave R1 a weight of 50 and we gave R2 a weight of 100. Well, in that example, for every one time we gave out R1's virtual MAC address, we would give out router R2's virtual MAC address twice because 100 is 2 times 50. That's a way that we could adjust the weight. And there's another way that we could use this weighting. We could use it with tracking. Remember with HSRP, we had interface tracking and object tracking. And with VRRP, we had just object tracking. But even with that, we could still track the line protocol state of an interface. So essentially, we did have interface tracking. Well, with GLBP, we don't technically have interface tracking, but we do have object tracking. And what we can do with object tracking is say, I want to track maybe the state of a particular interface. And if that interface goes down, or maybe I'm tracking whether or not a route is in the IP routing table, and if that route disappears, what I could do in conditions like that, when those tracking objects go down, I could say I want to reduce the weight by a certain amount. Suddenly, this router or this multi-layer switch becomes less attractive. It has a lower weight. It starts handling a lower percentage of the traffic. In fact, we can have some thresholds set. And we can say, if you draw below this threshold, if your weight gets down to 20 as an example, then the AVG could temporarily stop handing out that AVF's virtual MAC address 
in response to ARP queries. And then maybe that route came back and maybe that interface came back up. In that case, if the weight got back to a certain level, we can set a high watermark threshold. If we get back to a certain level, then the AVF can start accepting traffic again. And the AVG will once again start handing out that AVF's virtual MAC address in response to ARP queries. And before we get into the configuration in our next video, just a few extra things I want you to know about GOBP. We know that HSRP is Cisco proprietary and VRRP is an open standard. Well, GLBP is also Cisco proprietary. We know that HSRP cannot have the virtual IP address be the same as an interface's IP address, but VRRP does allow a virtual IP address to match an interface's IP address. Well, GLBP is like HSRP in that respect. You cannot have a virtual IP address match an interface's IP address. And GLBP is going to use the same multicast group to send messages that's used by HSRP version 2, which is 224.0.0.102. And GLBP by default also has the same timers that HSRP has. Specifically, it has a hello time of 3 seconds and a hold time timer of 10 seconds. And Cisco does support GLBP authentication both plain text authentication and MD5 authentication. But please keep in mind, your mileage may vary. You may or may not have GLBP support based on your model of Cisco Catalyst switch or router. Please check the documentation for your device and your specific version of Cisco IOS to see whether or not you have GLBP support. And now with this better understanding of GLBP operation, let's set it up in our next video. <music>